Tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Russell Shorter. He is the author of four previous award-winning books, including Descartes' Bones and The Island at the Center of the World. Mr. Shorter is also a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine. From 2008 to 2013, he was the director of John Adams Institute in Amsterdam, which was established to promote cultural exchange between the United States and Netherlands, and to provide a window onto the United States for Dutch audiences. Uh, whereas the island at the center of the world told the story of New York, New York's founding by Dutch colonists, in his latest book, Mr. Shorter goes back to Netherlands and to the city where he had lived for six years. Amsterdam, a history of the world's most liberal city, is, is both a fascinating biography of a city and a biography of liberalism as an idea. Publishers Weekly already picked it as one of their best books of 2013, and also has quite a few uh, fans on staff, including myself. And now I'm going to pass the mic to our guest. Please welcome Russell Shorter. Thank, thank you, Anton, and thank you, P and P, for including me in your illustrious series. And thank you all for being here. You all have many things you could be doing, and yet here you are. So I appreciate it. Um, I uh, I'll just get, orient you. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My voice is a little fuzzy from uh, traveling around promoting my book, which is a good problem to have. Um, I uh, so I've been giving talks. That is just talking about the book, and then last night. Uh, the event, uh, I was at the Dutch Embassy, of all places, and they suggested that I do a reading. So I did, and I kind of liked it. So I'll talk a little bit and then read just a couple of pages, if you don't mind, and then I'm happy to have kind of a conversation. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, well, to start in a sort of storytelling way, once upon a time, I was living in the East Village of New York, and um, my daughter was a toddler, and the nearest open space for her to run around and uh, toddle was the churchyard of St. Mark's in the Bowery, which, um, if any of you know it, is uh, many of the tombs of early New York families are there flush with the ground. And one of the tombs is actually in the foundation of the church, and that's uh, Peter Stuyvesant's grave. And because the church was originally his family chapel, and that was his um, bordurai, his family, the farm, uh, when he was a director of the Dutch colony of New Netherland. And um, I have uh, for, um, I, I, I guess I've uh, learned uh, enough about myself to have some idea of the way I work, at least in retrospect. And I tend to try to go to origins of things. And living in New York, I was interested in trying to get at the origins of New York. And I knew, as most people do, that New York was founded by the Dutch, and that New York was once New Amsterdam, and that there was somebody named Peter Stuyvesant, and uh, that he had a wooden leg, and probably not much else I knew at the time. Um, but so I, th I thought I would first look for something to read, and didn't find much really about that, uh, besides the stories of Washington Irving, which are really kind of surreal fiction. Um, and uh, I eventually uh, discovered that there has been a project going on since 1974 to translate and publish the archives of this colony uh, at, at the New York State Library in Albany. And I uh, hooked myself up to, the, to them and began working with them and eventually realized that this uh, was uh, the subject not just for a magazine article, which is what I originally thought, but for a book because it was really a way to tell the beginnings not just of New York's history, but of American history. In other words, you could just as legitimately tell the story of American history from this vantage point as you could from, say, Boston, which is, or New England anyway, uh, which is the traditional uh, model. So I, <clears throat> I wrote that book, excuse me. I wrote that book and um, I argued in it that um, the Dutch left some important things behind. They left a lot of little things behind. And I'm just as interested, frankly, in the little things, like why do we eat cookies? Why don't we eat biscuits? The English word is biscuit. Well, the Dutch word is cookie. That's why. And the first cookies were in New Amsterdam. Um, and uh, coleslaw is Dutch for cabbage salad. And uh, we, for, for better or worse, that has, that has hung around. Uh, the American Santa Claus comes from the Dutch Sinterklaas. Um, so there are a lot of these little things which are kind of clues to the fact that, uh, the idea that in fact they left something here. But the big uh, things they left behind, I argued, were two. The notion of tolerance, which they more or less invented in the 17th century in Europe, uh, 
uh, as kind of a glue to bind different uh, peoples together. And their very uh, original approach to free trade. And if you think about it, tolerance, a mixed society, and free trade, those two things together are kind of a recipe for New York City. Um, and when the English took over in 1664, which of course they did, which is why I'm speaking to you in English, um, they, uh, they realized that this was a going concern. New Amsterdam was a fully functioning uh, uh, trading city, and they kept everything in place. And a lot of the first governors of New York, or the first uh, mayors of New York City were, uh, were Dutch, so they kept everything in place. And if you f fast forward into the 19th century when the great waves of people came uh, from Europe to America, they landed by and large in Manhattan, and they saw there this teeming mix of people speaking different languages and striving to get ahead by what we would call upward mobility. And they said, this is America. And it wasn't America, it was New York. Uh, and it was New York because it had been New Amsterdam. But as they emigrated westward, they took that idea with them. So as a, as a writer, I'm interested, as a historian, I'm interested in how ideas spread. Uh, and so this cluster of ideas that form in this one part of Europe and uh, land in uh, this uh, on this wilderness island of Manhattan, and then eventually spread around. I, I find that fascinating. Um, so then, uh, a few years later, I moved to Amsterdam, and um, I uh, shortly thereafter decided that I would write a book about the city. And when I did, it occurred to me that the approach that I would take would be to to write about a city. There are few places, I think. Uh, that are so uh, identified with an idea. And to me, Amsterdam is really identifiable with the idea of liberalism. Uh, I called the book, uh, the, I subtitled it, A History of the World's Most Liberal City, um, because for one thing, I wanted to immediately, you know, when I, over the past six years, when I say to someone that I live in Amsterdam, they go, ah, okay. You know, because everybody has a certain association with Amsterdam. And I wanted to kind of address that right off the bat. And I try to do that in the book. But really what I'm getting at with this notion of liberalism is the classical uh, definition of the word, which goes back to the Latin liber, meaning free, and is a philosophy, very broadly speaking, a philosophy based on the idea of individual liberty, individual freedom, the valuing of, indivi of individuals. Um, so that then broadly, is what underlies these things that the Dutch that I was interested in, that the Dutch brought to the colony of New Netherland and that spread around America. So the next question then was, well, how, why did this city become associated with these things? So that's what I tried to do in the book. I tried to um, look at this city and this idea and how they kind of grew up together and why. Um, and very briefly, I'm somebody who's interested in um, looking at how culture develops in relation to geography, looking at geography as a, a, a measure or a, a, an arbiter of uh, the development of culture. And I think that it just makes sense that the more inhospitable, inhospitable uh, a climate and geography, the more that culture will be uh, identified by it, whether it's in a desert or a mountaintop, or in this case, in a, this little far northern shoulder of Europe that is essentially a vast river delta. Uh, so the people there, um, started in the Middle Ages, when the, re the rest of Europe in the Middle Ages, you, you, you have the picture in your mind of the manorial system, where you've got a nobleman who has a castle and has grounds, and there are peasants who work the grounds, and they, um, they work for the nobleman, they pay rent, and he in turn provides protection. And this, it's a fixed system that, that carries from one generation to the next, so that if you're born into it, your children are gonna occupy the same position, and it lasted for a long time. Um, but in this corner of Europe, that didn't ho take hold, largely because the land didn't allow it. Uh, it's a vast river delta, and people had to deal with the fact that, um, the every, that every year the shoreline would be remade. Uh, you couldn't depend, you couldn't uh, be certain that the area that you're planting a crop is going to be there the next year, it might be underwater. Uh, so people in small groups uh, banded together, and they did this backbreaking work to reclaim land from the sea and from the rivers, to build dikes and dams and pumps. And uh, when they did, they created what they call polders, 
And when they did, uh, that land became theirs. It wasn't owned by a nobleman or by a church or by a king. And so they divided, and the, the <clears throat> medieval records in the Dutch provinces show these transactions happening. People become owners of plots. And then they start buying and selling and renting these plots from each other. So they develop a kind of proto-modern economy, which is very different from what was going on in the rest of Europe. And so when that happens then, uh, that it sets off this notion, I guess you could say, inside the mind that <clears throat> there are other possibilities. Your children can have a better life. You can, you can get rich. Uh, so that you have a sort of mental encouragement to think differently, to innovate. And that sets off this chain of uh, events uh, over the course of a number of generations, innovations that allow them to build up, improbably, to build up uh, to build this little uh, corner of Europe into, the, for a very, very brief period, the greatest nation in the world, the greatest shipping nation. Um, and, uh, and so the Dutch then become an empire uh, that has no rival for a period of about 70 years, really. 1602, I think, is when you could begin it. And it ends very abruptly in 1672. Um, but for that brief time, all these things flourish, and th things... <clears throat> when I uh, hit on this idea of liberalism and associating it with this city, then you sort of sound it out, you know, you try it out in different contexts. And as I was um, thinking about it, what I would do is different people, well-known people that you associate with Amsterdam in its golden age, I would re read about them with this in my mind, and sure enough, every single one of them, every person in every innovation, ends up relating easily relating back to this notion so it's something that that was quite remarkable that happened there and then that spread elsewhere um so what i since the, since the book is about an, the idea of individualism and individual freedom uh i tried and, and since i write narrative history i tried to uh, focus as much as possible in the book on individuals and let them tell the stories and let them tell the story uh, so what I thought I would read briefly is a section about, now, as it happens, most of those individuals are pretty well known, uh, but some of them are not, and I thought I would read a few pages about one who is not well known. And what I'm doing here is, um, I'm, I think anyone who writes history or reads history is interested in um, just trying, you know, that simple childish thing of trying to imagine what it was like. Uh, the Dutch, the great Dutch historian Housinga has this wonderful line about doing history where he says what motivates him is our perpetual as astonishment that the past was once a living reality. And that's what, <clears throat> that's what motivates me. And um, so that's what you try to, whether it's, you know, Athens in the age of Pericles or ancient Rome or Amsterdam in its golden age or jazz age New York, whatever it is, you, you, you are trying to grasp that. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is by means of this person, who was a real uh, person, uh, I'm following her entry into the city and in so doing, trying to give a sense of what it must have been like uh, to someone who was coming into this place that is suddenly the greatest city in the world. Let's follow, as an almost random example, a poor newcomer who arrived in the city just about at its height. Her name was Geertje Dirks. She was born in Adam to the north. She had been married to a sailor, and he died. We know, that, <clears throat> we know that she had worked at an inn in Horn and had some family in a village called Ransdorp, and that her brother was also a sailor. But the fact that she headed for Amsterdam tells us that in her widowhood she could depend on no one, and so had to find a future for herself. She might have traveled by water coach, a transit system that had become commonplace in the province of Holland by the 1630s, and that foreigners marveled at. These were passenger boats that glided along the canals and rivers towed by horses, and they signaled, even before one entered the city, a newly developing society, one that stressed order, comfort, and egalitarianism. The boats were covered, were lined with benches, could hold up to 50 people, and followed a regular schedule between towns, of which one could find printed copies. Passengers paid fares based on the length of the journey, 
various currencies were accepted. Everyone, rich and poor, used them, and foreigners often found this free mixing of castes to be one of their first experiences of the novel Dutch egalitarianism. Food and drink were sold on board. People got drunk. In the evening, songs broke out, sometimes fights. If there was a dark corner, a prostitute might try to make a quick florin from a traveling salesman. The passenger boats wound their way close enough to the landscape as to be in it, and slowly enough for travelers to exchange words with farmers in the fields. The countryside of Holland unfolded for a traveler, as it still does, in its endlessly massing flatness. There was the green of the polder, cut by the straight lines of water channels. The horizon was a line studded by cows and an occasional tree. Then there was the sky and its cloudscapes, tunnels and chasms and cathedrals and phantasmagoria of clouds, mounting the heights and marching in vaults and columns, ennobled by sunlight or furiously cross-hatched by the force of an impending storm. Then walls and church tops would rise up for interested passengers to observe. A city. And one hubbub of insects and birds would be replaced by another, of people and commerce. Then would come the bells. Foreign travelers to the Low Countries always remarked on the ceaseless donging of church bells in Dutch towns. Once ashore, a newcomer like Hirche Dirks would want to wander and begin exploring sites that had become legendary in just a few years. The main site was the city itself, its alleys and keys. The sleek new canal rings were already talked of as the physical manifestation of this golden age that had descended on the city. Some of the new houses, which doubled as warehouses, were five stories high, skyscrapers to someone from a village. At the time Hirche Dirks arrived, the first portion, portion of this ongoing urban development project was finished, with new brick homes lining both sides of each canal. Further along in the direction of the river, the work of the pile drivers and bricklayers was still going on. The ring canals were then, as now, both a tourist, trap, a, a tourist site and a trap, for newcomers would be confused by the semicircular construction. You would start out walking south along a street, and without making any turns, end up heading north. You also had to watch out for the coaches, which had only recently come into normal use among the wealthy, and which would go barreling crazily through the narrow streets and over the humpbacked bridges. The Amsterdammers themselves were as well a source of confusion for newcomers. When, Willem of, when, when William of Orange rode into the city in triumph, in, uh, Amsterdam had had 30,000 inhabitants. That was about um, 40 years earlier than this. Now there were close to 140,000 plus swarms of undocumented aliens, which a scholar recently estimated would have numbered in the hundreds of thousands, flooding into the city to work on the expansion or looking for places on East India Company ships. And the inhabitants were a bewildering mix. At least a third were foreign born. Most immigrants were from Germany and Scandinavia, but Kircher would also have seen and heard Africans, Turks, Inuits, Laplanders, and others. The city was a cacophony of languages. It was also, however, very well organized, and that too would have taken some getting used to. Amsterdam comprised a maze of bureaucracies and societies that had to be negotiated. There were taxes to be paid on everything from beer to rent. Nearly every profession had a guild, and each guild had rules to follow. It must have seemed that the city had invented every possible job for a human to do, and some that humans had no business doing. There were people who made only balances for scales, people who only made glue, people who only bored pearls to be strung. The textile industry employed not just weavers, but wool washers, nap shearers, bleachers, dyers, and fullers. Wire drawers worked gold, silver, and copper into wire for use in jewelry, which more and more ordinary people were wearing, and scientific equipment. Foulness fighters hung, hauled dung, Piskikers, literally piss lookers, could cure whatever was ailing you, or said they could, by studying your urine. A small town girl would have been rendered dizzy by the activity, and in this city that had set itself to be the entrepot to the world, the display. Among the canals you could find live elephant, elephants and armadillos, pickled snakes and frogs, microscopes and telescopes, old Chinese porcelain, and new Delftware. 
and of course spices and herbs, not only for cooking, but for aiding digestion, loosening stools, dilating cervixes, and warding off disease. Stores went far beyond garden variety pepper and cinnamon to include exotica like scammony, zedori, galangal, spikenard, euphorbia, and what was billed as dragon's blood. There was food everywhere to goad poor and yearning immigrants. There was a poultry market, a butter market, vegetable markets, and butcher stalls. Street hawkers sold cinnamon cakes and roasted nuts. At noon, the traveler might see and smell through house windows, families sitting down to bowls of pea soup or the national dish of chutzpah, a, a stew of vegetables, chopped meat, ginger, and lemon juice, along with knobs of hard, dark rye bread and beer for young and old. Peering through the stained glass windows of finer houses, our woman from the provinces would have noted that the wealthy were now eating on porcelain, drinking from porcelain mugs, employing finely wrought silver cutlery. Nowadays, after a meal, people were fanatics for tobacco. Men, young and old alike, would pull out their long-stemmed pipes and start puffing. Kircher would likely have found temporary residents in the Jordan, the area of the new part of the city that sat astride the canal belt, which, housed mostly, which mostly housed the poor and working class. We don't know when she first arrived in Amsterdam, but in 1642, Geertje Dirks began her own upwardly mobile trajectory when she made her way to the Breestraat, or Broad Street. It ran through what had until recently been one of the fashionable neighborhoods of the old city, until its wealthier residents began to decamp for the new canal zone, and their places were taken by members of Amsterdam's large Jewish population, as well as by artists and artisans. Geertje needed work and she had gotten a tip. There was a couple who lived here in a grand double-sized house. They had recently had a baby. The wife was doing poorly. They needed help. Hircha stood on the stoop, perhaps still heavily swaddled in her North Holland dress with the bonnet drawn tight around the sides of her face. A bonnet might have obscured some of her features, but it could not have masked the fact that she had eyes that danced, eyes that whatever she had been through showed a keen will to survive, someone still vibrant to life's possibilities. Now, I, um, I uh, uh, talk about her eyes there. The reason I know about her eyes is because the person whose house she went to was Rembrandt. And uh, Rembrandt and his wife, his wife was, uh, uh, had um, just given birth, and she was doing very poorly, uh, his wife was. And uh, they, took, they needed someone to help. Kircher became their servant either before the wife died or after his wife died, she became uh, his lover. And uh, they then, and she, uh, he then, th their affair lasted a number of years. He uh, gave her his wife's jewelry. Uh, then he hired a younger housekeeper and she became his new lover. <laughs> and he was ready to set Kircher aside. And this is where I infer that um, her personality was a feisty one because she didn't uh, sit still for that. And so uh, she refused. he wanted the jewelry back. She wouldn't give it back. Uh, they set off a lawsuit and countersuit. And uh, it ended with Rembrandt using his power with the authorities to have her committed to a workhouse. Uh, so her, um, her story ended sadly. She, she was in the workhouse for a number of years, came out and died shortly thereafter. And if you know anything about Rembrandt, his, the end of his life was, was pretty sad too. Um, so, but what I, um, this, so I'm focusing on individuals, but also on this notion of liberalism. And as I said, the people and things that you associate with Amsterdam and its golden age all seem to come back to this notion. And Rembrandt is, a, a, to me, a stunning case in point. Uh, this kind of society that developed this new individualism uh, as we're now in the golden ages, it's manifesting itself in all sorts of ways. And the most obvious way was in art, this turn that Dutch art took toward not just the secular, but toward um, individuals and very ordinary individuals, it's sort of what everyone was doing, someone selling fish on the street or someone pouring milk into a bowl. Uh, and you have to kind of stop and try to think back how strange that would have been to others to see that people are devoting uh, paintings to subjects like this, to such ordinary subjects. But this was the sudden craze there, and it eventually caught on and spread elsewhere. Uh, Rembrandt became famous. He moved from Leiden to Amsterdam 
and he became famous originally for his way with portraits. Portraits were suddenly a craze among the Dutch. And this, I mean, nothing speaks more to this, this notion of this new uh, valuing of the individual than that. People lined up to have him paint them. Uh, uh, he painted a few we uh, wealthy and fam uh, famous people. Almost everybody painted was wealthy because he, he charged a lot. Um, but uh, most of them, wealthy merchants, they were wealthy merchants or, or furniture makers um, and their wives. And they lined up to pay a lot of money for him to do it. And uh, there were a lot of good Dutch artists who could paint what you looked like. But Rembrandt seemed to do one better. He seemed to be able to paint who you were inside. And that's what captivated them. And these people are, um, you know, by and large, completely unimportant to history. But every one of them has a Wikipedia page today. Every one of them, uh, their, their, their portraits are in the Hermitage or in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam or in the Metropolitan Museum in New York or in the National Gallery of Art. Um, and people are fascinated by them still, I think, because they are the first people <clears throat> who are like us. They are the first people who are interested in individuals in the way we are. That's a, a, in art, you see, you see it in a way that you can't see it anywhere else. It was also in this new, this new liberalism was also apparent in publishing. About a third of all the books published in the entire world in the 17th century were published in the city of Amsterdam. It was, it, it was incredibly open center. It, during the English Civil Wars, people, both sides came to Amsterdam uh, publishers to have their tracts printed. It was apparent in the structure of the city itself. As Amsterdam expanded and they dug these canals that I was just talking about there that Geertje would have uh, witnessed, increasing the city fivefold, the size of the city fivefold, um, it, it was this new city that they developed around their medieval center was something new. It was all kind of devoted to and wrapped around this idea of uh, valuing the individuals. It was made for the comfort of individuals. There was, it was the first place ever to develop street lighting at night, uh, to, de to develop a modern, what we would call kind of modern fire department with a uh, uh, fire engines and fire hoses. Um, and the canals themselves were, first of all, they were a, a very practical way to turn the problem of water to an advantage. But they also became like arms that just reached around the world, which is what the, the uh, Dutch East India Company did, and grabbed all the world's goods and brought them back home. So that you could be a, uh, a trader, a merchant in Amsterdam, who, uh, you could ride out to the East Indies to, to oversee the uh, collection of your shipment of spices, say, and you could ride with them all the way back to Europe, into the Eye, the harbor of Amsterdam, and transfer with them onto a, a lighter vessel and ride up one of the canals right to your doorstep because the, it was the whole city was structured for the convenience of these people of the people who owned these individual um, canal houses and the, and the house the canal house was the the you came up a few steps and you were in the office of the the merchant or whoever it was whatever the work they did behind there and upstairs was where the family lived and then the top floors was where your products were stored. And all these canal houses have what's called a hoist beam, which you ever see, it sticks out the top with a hook on it. And so the goods were just hauled right up there with a, a rope and pulley. And that was your, your whole, um, set, uh, your whole um, setup. The, uh, the writer Witold Rybyshinsky wrote a book called um, Home, A Short History of an Idea, in which he argues that the original home, home as we think of it, originated with the Dutch canal house of the 17th century. So that um, it's the first place, he said, where home meant a man and a woman and their children. Before that, it was a much looser thing. It was uh, extended family and servants and various others, people sort of coming in and out. But this was a defined place. And that is yet one other way that um, this, this new focus on the individual sort of comes into a very practical, in a, you know, you can't get more practical than, than bricks, um, a more in, into this very, very practical shape. And it def helps to define the city and this, this new relationship of the city to, to individuals. Um, uh, let me just say a couple of quick words to, you know, I'm, we're still in the 17th century. I meant to kind of go further, but I'll uh, bring it up uh, a little bit further um, and talk uh, uh, just for a minute about uh, more recent times in the city, and then I'll happily uh, uh, entertain questions. Or if somebody disagrees with everything I said, you can do that. Um, uh, the city in, you know, the, the, the association that we have with Amsterdam that so many people have now, I think is in fact related to everything I've just been talking about. 
liberal in the sense of individual freedom. There is a whole strain and has always been in uh, the Dutch sensibility that sees this as kind of an ideological value, as a good, to sort of keep pushing uh, individual freedom and keep uh, allowing the progressive movement, you might say. Um, World War II uh, was this, you know, needless to say, was this tremendous threat to this whole notion of liberalism. The city was under uh, Nazi occupation. Not just that, but Amsterdam, um, uh, it has the, the, a higher percentage of Jews who had lived in Amsterdam died in the war than in any other city in Western Europe. So this was a, to say the least, an enormous failing. And in the aftermath of the war, for, the, for the, a book like this, I was able to do uh, research in the form of interviewing people, say, since the war um, for research. And a lot of them told me how in the 50s and 60s, there was a huge amount of um, soul searching because they felt that there had been this great, they had um, transgressed this tradition uh, and they wanted to do something about it. And so in the 50s, okay, so you, we survived this war, we survived this terrible thing, and now what starts to happen, they said, is here come corporations and here come TV commercials and cheap products and cigarettes and cars and, and American bombs being stored on their soil. And so suddenly comes this counterculture movement uh, and so Amsterdam, uh, in a very different way, leads the way. And uh, they, their movement there was called Provo, as in provoke. They wanted to provoke the authorities because the young people were upset about, uh, about all of this. Uh, and all of that then comes to a head, I think, uh, when John Lennon and Yoko Ono decide that they will hold their bed in for peace at the Amsterdam Hilton and spend one week inviting all of the world's press to come and talk with them. And the sort of uh, side effect of that was all this press came to Amsterdam and they saw this place with, you know, its version of hippies and counterculture and, and uh, protests. And that then began to cement this idea that we have of Amsterdam now on, uh, on people's minds. And that's, you know, kind of been stuck ever since. And, uh, you know, the, the, the people, the leaders of Amsterdam have tried, lately they're trying to deal with that, they want to clean it up, they don't want to have that image. On the other hand, they're very proud of the image and they want to, so they want to try to find, figure out what's the right balance. And it goes all the way back, I think, to this notion of, you know, how these people developed in the Middle Ages and that's still, that, that, that everybody forming these, um, uh, these groups to, to reclaim land from the sea, div in the process of doing that created this sensibility, the sensibility of every, these groups sticking together. And uh, that, so one thing that leads to is th this notion of tolerance, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna allow, you're gonna try to allow everybody something. You're gonna try to give everyone their say. And that you see that, uh, for example, with the phenomenon of the coffee shops, which is where you buy marijuana. Coffee, or marijuana is not, le not legal in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, if you ask a policeman, where can I buy marijuana? They'll say, in the coffee shop. But if the coffee shop changed its name to a marijuana shop, it would be closed down. So this is part of the, this is, you know, this is not uh, an expression of tolerance as like, oh, we all think it's great to do whatever you want. It's some people thinking that and other people very much thinking the opposite. And yet they're all sitting around the table as they were in the Middle Ages trying to decide, you know, that they have to band together against nature. And the, the, the feeling is we'll give everybody something. So you don't want it legal, so we won't make it legal. But you think it's a value, so we'll allow it in a certain way. And so this is the, the there's a Dutch word, gedogen, which <clears throat> gets at this notion. Uh, you know, Americans kind of think of tolerance as this grand, you know, uh, celebrating diversity thing. For the Dutch, mostly it's a more restricted, more practical thing that has to do with everybody making everybody a little bit happy, keeping everybody uh, at the table. And in that sense, Dutch politics is kind of the opposite of American politics, where American politics, you know, it's like, we hate you so much that we'll shut down the government. The, the Dutch find that they just, to them, that's unfathomable, because no matter what, you stay, you keep negotiating, you stay at the table. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>